Good morning, I'm Jodo Wale, professor at the University of Bologna, and I will be your instructor for the lessons on karst. Now we will see how the cave morphology can tell us something about the genesis of these caves. This is the topic I'm interested in most of all, that's the, the formation of caves, because surface morphologies have been studied quite well since many, many years. Speleogenesis is something that has evolved a lot in the last 20 years because not a lot of people went into caves to study them and many of the processes and modeling things have been done in the last 20 years. So it's really a science, a developing science. It's important also because, um, for example, petroleum reservoirs all over the world, 80% of them are in limestones and they're deep underground. So the exploration companies for petroleum reservoirs, they're interested in how these voids form, the small voids meaning, because that's where petroleum is found, okay? So they want to have an idea how fast it is, how they form, where they form, where they can be found. Speleogenesis is the genesis of caves, so all the processes that are involved in the formation of the big voids in which we can walk. A cave normally is something we can walk in. So even the petroleum geologist is not interested in man-sized cavities. It's interested in small fractures that are enlarged by dissolution. There's uh, two kinds of processes. Both of them uh, involve water and some of them acids. There's a chemical process and there's a physical one. A chemical process is the dissolution. So the rock that is dissolved and makes voids grow. The physical one is an erosion process. That's the things that happen in any rock. So water that takes away fragments of rock. Both of them are active. The chemical one, especially at the beginning. The physical one afterwards. We will see this. So we need waters. There's two types of waters in cave formation. We have the water coming from above, the rainfall. This water penetrates into the mountains and makes caves, okay? And that's water that normally has CO2 inside. So the rainwater has CO2 of the atmosphere, and this dissolves. The other one is the deep water, meaning that's water that comes from below, that happens in the, in the world, in many places, by the way. That's one of the new topics that has been developed in the last 15 years, not more. Because we have seen that in many areas where we don't have rain, we have big cave systems forming underground and there's no rain, so it was crazy. And in fact, we have seen that it was water that came from below through the fractures and brought acidity that was completely different. It can be CO2, but some of them have sulfuric acid. And these, we can find these signs as minerals that are in the caves. Lechuguilla in America is an, a big example of this. It has one small entrance, it's 212 kilometers I think it is now, and it is completely formed by water that came from below. Carl's but Cavan's the same. So that's a very big cave and there's, there's no river inside. There's only water coming from below, about 12 million years ago. It's an old cave. So the acids can be carbonic acid and sulfuric acid, in fact. The sulfuric acid speleogenesis, which is the most recently studied one, is very, very fast. So the caves can form in, in a very short time span because sulfuric acid is much, is much more strong than carbonic acid. And they're very nice, by the way. They have nice morphologies. Where is the sulfuric acid coming from? Uh, it ha can have different uh, origins. The most common one is a petroleum reservoir that uh, uh, loses H2S, which is a hydrogen sulfide, and uh, oxidating this sulfide makes sulfuric acid. It can be bacterial, it can be volcanic, it can have different origins. We are not going to talk about these cave systems because here there's no sulfuric acid. It's normal cost system, I call these. That's the typical uh, river or rainwater going underground and forming a cave. So it's meteoric waters, more or less. Uh, what is important is gravity, of course. That's everywhere. <laughs> Even on the planet Mars, it would be like this. 
So we need the water going into the mountain and have a difference in level so the water can flow downstream. It will not flow on the surface, it will go underground and form caves. No. Normally it will go down very fast to a sort of base level, which is the water table level. Even though we shouldn't talk about water table in karst areas, that's something strange as well. But the water will go down very deep and then start flowing more or less horizontally towards the springs. No. That would be the normal karst system. There's three phases in this paleogenesis. There's an establishment of protoconduits, which are uh, very small sized passages. We cannot go in there. Once they get uh, one centimeter in width, you start with the erosion process. So sediments can be entrained inside these conduits and you start to enlarge them very fast making a configuration of a pre preferential drainage network, meaning, I will talk about this later, uh, that only some of the fractures will be chosen by the water flow. It's like an electrical uh, circuit. If you put electrical current on two sides of uh, something, you know, the current will have a flow path, which is the most rapid way to get there, more or less. So it will not pass all over the place. It will choose one way, in karst is the same. If you put water in, into a, a place, a rock, you know, the water will find its way, which will be the fastest one. And all the rest will be neglected. It will not pass over there. That's what is the configuration. So that's why we have caves. If it weren't like this, we would have all fractures enlarged and no sizable cave passages. No? And then we have a very rapid enlargement of those fractures that have been chosen in the second step. Everything starts when you have a hydraulic gradient, so a difference in level from the water where it gets in and where it has to go out. Meaning in this condition, no cave is forming. It's not possible. You need to tilt it a bit or have an entrenchment of a valley nearby so the water point where it can go out goes lower and then you start flowing. And then you need a bit of time to form the caves. How much time? Depends. But in limestone we are talking about 5,000 years to have an enlargement of all the fractures from less than a millimeter to about one centimeter. No? Everything uh, is dissolving all over the place. No. So all the fractures start growing. There's one fracture, or two, or three, not a lot, that will reach one centimeter before all the others. I don't know why it happens, but it happens. There's always someone coming first. You know? The fracture that wins the competition starts concentrating the, all the flow nearby. It will capture the water from all the fractures close by, and all the water will flow in that fracture. In that way, when it's one centimeter wide, it will start entraining also clays and physical particles. So the enlargement is not only the solution, it starts also with erosion, physical one. So it boosts the enlargement. So we need 5,000 years to have an enlargement from something less than a millimeter to one centimeter. Once you get there, the fracture that is winning in 5,000 years will go from this to this immediately, so immediately, 5,000 years, more or less. So in limestone caves, we, we have to think about at least 10,000 years. So any sizable cave has an age of at least 10,000 years. It can be much more. It can be millions of years. Okay. What is important is to see that it's, there's a very rapid formation of caves once we have turbulent flow. The size of the caves, in, in the end, depends on the quantity of water we have available. So if you are in, a, in an area where there's not a lot of rainfall, we have small conduits. Because at a certain moment, the water is not enough to fill the entire conduit, so there will be air inside, and it starts entrenching and will go down, make a canyon. If we have a lot of water, we will have tunnels of about 20 meters size. And you can see this wandering around in the world. So here, we have caves of about up to five meter width. You know? In the tropics, like in Philippines or Borneo, where it rains 10 times more, we can have caves of even 50 meters width, canyons.
and, and even phreatic conduits, so complete tubes. Once it comes uh, to a certain size, it normally stops growing. It can continue growing in size only by collapse. That's the ancient the fossil stage, you know. There's no more water over there, everything starts collapsing because it's old and it becomes bigger. That's the same more or less, so we have the dissolution in the first phase. It takes quite some time to do this. That's all laminar flow, so it's the, the size of the fracture starts growing. It comes to about one centimeter width and then you have a boost and you, got, you have turbulent flow starting and you have a boost of the growth of the, the fracture. So it takes a long time to go to one centimeter and then it takes not a long time to make from one centimeter become a size of meter, two, three, whatever.